Think of it. For 30 years, a man, with all a man's hopes, fears, and aspirations. Then, for 12 years, a thing. It chills the blood. That is how famed orator and abolitionist Frederick Douglass described this book, Twelve Years a Slave by Solomon Northrup, published in the year 1853 under the genre of autobio. I chose to read this book because I have always been interested in history, especially during the American Civil War period. The book tells the tale of Solomon Northrup, a black man born free in Washington County where he had a wife and three children. He was very ingenuitive and came up with many ways of how to log on the Saratoga River. He could also play the fiddle very well. So when two men offered to pay him very well to play the fiddle in Washington, D.C., he readily agreed. However, Washington, being on the border between the free states and the slave states, meant that upon his arrival, all the two men had to do was move him south of the Mason-Dixon line, and they could sell him into slavery in Louisiana. Eventually, in Louisiana, he came up into the ownership of a man named Tibeats. Tibeats was widely renowned, even among the slave owners, as a unreasonable and uncouth man. One day, Solomon was planing down a board, and Tibeats complained he had not planed it down enough. So Solomon, apologizing for this apparent blunder, continued to plane. But before he had removed even another shaving of wood, Tibeats then complained he planed it down too much and assaulted Solomon. Solomon, beating back Tibeats, escaped to the boundary of the plantation. Tibeats left and retrieved hounds. This is how the story continues from there. In about three-fourths of an hour, several of the slaves shouted and made signs for me to run. Presently, looking up to the bayou, I saw Tibeats and two others on horseback, coming at a fast gait followed by a troop of dogs. There were as many of eight or ten of them. Distance as I was, I knew them. They belonged on the adjoining plantation. The dogs used on Bayou Buff for hunting slaves are a kind of bloodhound, but far more savage breed than is found in the northern states. They will attack a slave at their master's bidding and will cling on to him as the common bulldog will cling to a four-footed animal. Frequently, their loud bay is heard in the swamps, and then there is speculation as to what point the runaway will be overhauled. The same as New York hunters stop to listen to the hounds coursing along the hillsides and suggest to his companions that the fox will be taken at such a place. I never knew a slave escaping with his life from Bayou Buff. One reason is they are not allowed to learn the art of swimming and are incapable of crossing the most inconsiderable stream. In their flight, they can go in no direction but a little way without coming to a bayou. When the inevitable alternative is presented of being drowned or overtaken by the dogs, in youth I had practiced in the clear streams that flowed through my native district until I had become an expert swimmer and felt at home in the watery element. I stood upon the fence until the dogs had reached the cotton press. In an instant more, their long, savage yells announced they were on my track. Leaping down from my position, I ran towards the swamp. Fear gave me strength, and I exhorted it to the utmost. Every few moments I could hear the yelpings of the dogs. They were gaining on me. Every howl was nearer and nearer. Each moment I expected they would spring upon my back, expected to feel their long teeth sinking into my flesh. There were too many of them. I knew they would tear me to pieces, that they would worry me at once to death. I gasped for breath gasped forth a half other choking prayer to the Almighty to save me, to give me strength to reach some wide, deep bayou where I could throw them off my track or sink into its waters. Presently, I reached a thick palmetto bottom. As I fled through them, they made a loud rustling noise, not loud enough, however, to drown the voices of the dogs. Continuing my course due south, as nearly as I can judge, I came at length to water just over the shoe. The hounds at that moment could not have been five rods behind me. I could hear them crashing and plunging through the palmettos, their loud, eager yells making the whole swamp clamorous with the sound. Hope revived a little as I reached the water. If it were only deeper, they might lose a sense. scent, and thus disconcerted afford me the opportunity of evading them. Luckily, it grew deeper the farther I proceeded, now over my ankles, now halfway to my knees, now sinking a moment to my waist, and then emerging presently into more shallow places. The dogs had not gained upon me since I struck the water. Evidently, they were confused. 
Now their savage intonations grew more and more distant, assuring me that I was leaving them. Finally, I stopped to listen, but the long howl came booming on the air again, telling me I was not yet safe. From bog to bog where I had stepped, they could still keep upon my track, though impeded by the water. At length, to my great joy, I came to a wide bayou, and plunging in, had soon stemmed its sluggish current to the other side. There certainly the dogs would be confounded. The current carrying down the stream all traces of that slight, mysterious sense, which enables the quick-smelling hound to follow in the track of the fugitive. After crossing this bayou, the water became so deep I could not run. I was now in what I afterwards learned was called the Great Pacorti Swamp. It was filled with immense trees, the sycamore, the gum, the cotton, wood, and cypress, and extends. I am informed to the shore of the Caucasus River. For thirty or forty miles, it is without inhabitants, save wild beasts, the bear, the wildcat, the tiger, and great slimy reptiles that are crawling through it everywhere. Long before I reached the bayou, in fact, from the time I struck the water until I emerged from the swamp on my return, these reptiles surrounded me. I saw hundreds of moccasin snakes, every log and bog, every trunk of a fallen tree over which I was compelled to step or climb was alive with them. They crawled away at my approach, but sometimes in my haste I almost placed my hand or foot upon them. They are poisonous serpents, their bite more fatal than the rattlesnakes. Besides, I had lost one shoe, the sole having come entirely off, leaving the upper only dangling to my ankle. I saw also many alligators, great and small, lying in the water or on pieces of float wood. The noise I made usually startled them when they moved off and plunged into the deepest places. Sometimes, however, I would come directly upon a monster before observing it. In some cases, I would start back, run a short way around, and in that manner shun them. Straight forward, they will run a short distance rapidly, but do not possess the power of turning. In a crooked race, there is no difficulty in evading them. He was chased by dogs into a swamp filled with reptiles. Every turn he made was dangerous. The only hope he had was he pointed himself out of the swamp towards a man he had formerly been owned by named William Ford before being sold to T-Beats. William Ford was a very kind man, as slave owners go, so he made his way to Ford's plantation. Upon striking a road, he came across a hunter and his slave. Solomon, knowing the white hunter had the right to ins capture, him, capture him and send him to the jailhouse until t -Beats could pick him up, scared the man by ambushing him and shouting in the most devilish voice he can ma muster, Where is the plantation of William Ford? The man, shocked by this encounter, pointed fearfully towards the direction, and Solomon set off. Though, when he arrives at William's Fords, William ensures him that T-Beats would never kill him and sends him back. However, the spark that was shown by Solomon today of being willing to run away from the dogs, chased through a swamp of serpents and many other reptiles and dangerous animals, will appear later in the book, showing he is willing to try and make an escape.